So excited about sharing with you again, and I want to talk to you uh, from, uh, from a different perspective that you may not be accustomed to hearing at conferences. And for the sake of, this is, this is the conference opened last night, it'll end, uh, 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 it'll end in a couple of days, and so this is my time, so I want to take this time that is given to me, and I'm, I'm watching the time, so I got it, uh, you know, clicking down here. Um, so, uh, so for my time, I want to reshape you into another direction in particular of what you typically receive when you come to a conference. And typically, what we are prone to do when we as pastors and leaders come together uh, in one uh, gathered, concentrated place in order to receive a deposit. And the things that we do in between the sessions and things like that, that, uh, that ha often happens in conferences that I have, that have had the opportunity to attend over the years and, and different conferences and stuff like that. And uh, so, so I hope to, in this moment, sort of reshape your thinking in my time that is given to me. So let me, let me, let me start this. Let me, let me start by reminding you that the Christian life is a life filled with paradoxes. Now, and paradox is simply a, a way to better illustrate a truth that you're trying to communicate. So sometimes you try to communicate a thing, and it's not fully understood until you present what is considered a paradox, or what I call a contrast. And in the Christian life, every leader, every pastor should know, if you don't, you'll grow into knowing, that the Christian life is always counterculture to the culture of the world that we live in. The Christian life is always, in fact, it feels unnatural when you try to take what is in the world, the culture, and try to conform it to the church. It appears to be unnatural because there are certain spiritual DNA that God has wired into the church culture culture and everything else does not belong. And a part of what has always been uh, the, the move of God is to you know, continually present what I call this paradox or this contrast that exists in the church. So for instance, I'll give you an example. It, 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 one of the contrasts and the paradoxes in the Christian church is in order to find something, you must first be willing to lose it. That's a contrast. We find something before we, listen, we, in order to find it, we got to be willing to lose it. In fact, Matthew says he that finds his life must do what? He must lose it first. And he that loses his life for my sake will find it. So the contrast is, in order for me to find my life, I got to be willing to lose my life. Losing my life facilitates me finding my life. How about this? How about this? How about this? You didn't get that, so let me just tell you like this. How about in order... In order to receive, you must first give. The only way to receive is you must first give. Giving, the contrast, the contrast because in the culture, in the, in the culture, it's the opposite. In the culture, you, you receive in order to give, but in the church environment, you give in order to receive. That's the contrast. If I'm going to receive, I got to practice the pattern of giving. How about this? How about this? This is a contrast. This is a paradox in the Christian church. If you want to be exalted, you have to learn how to be humble. Humility is the contrast to exaltation. If you want to be raised, you must be willing to go down. If you want to go up, you must first be willing to get low. The contrast in the Christian community that God has wired into the church. How about this? How about this? This is the contrast. He says, if you want to be great, you got to be small. Your smallness is the pathway to greatness. If you want to be big in the eyes of the Lord, you got to small up yourself in the presence of Almighty God. How about this? Here's another contrast, Daniel. He says that if you want to rule, you got to learn how to serve. Serving is the process or the process for which leads to ruleship. You will not learn how to rule well if you've not learned how to serve well. The contrast, the paradoxes that exist. How about this? I know you don't like this one, but this is a good one. This is a great paradox. The Bible says this, that in order for me to live, I must be willing to die. This is the contrast. I must be willing to die in order to live. The contrast, the paradoxes that exist in the Christian church has already exist, and God has always been, I found him to always be counter-culture, and sometimes, depending on the church, he's counter-church. 
And there are other key words that are key words that I believe that are trigger. They are trigger words for getting, for getting a right relationship with God and growing that relationship with the Lord. They were three words. And they're words that are not celebrated nor circulated in all of Christianity and most of Christian in the day. These are trigger words. These are trigger words that, that we are we are distancing ourselves from those words, and yet the Holy Spirit is moving our heart to get closer to those words again so that we might be able to embrace them. So, so I already mentioned one of them had to do with humility. We, we're not embracing humility anymore. There's another word that we don't we don't embrace as much in the church anymore, and that's the word repentance. Nobody talks about repentance anymore. We spend more time talking about reward than we talk about repentance. But repentance is still, regardless of whether it's not popular or your favorite word, it is still the word that draws the change in our heart towards God. Words like righteousness and salvation and confession uh, and uh, these things that when we activate and initiate these words, I believe, ultimately allows us to infiltrate the throne room of heaven and have an impact on our lives that make us counterculture rather than in agreement with the culture. But there is this theme. This theme is resource and release. This theme is resource and release. So I have a resource that I want to deposit to you today that if you would own this resource, it will legitimately release the power of God. Right, so are you ready, right? So look at the neighbor and tell them I'm ready for the resource. Go ahead and tell them I'm ready. I'm ready for the resource. Come on, look at another neighbor, give them a high five, and tell them I'm ready for the resource. It is, there's a resource. Now, it's an unexpected resource, you may get angry with me once I give you the resource. You may not be very happy. You might all get together and pray that your mom and dad of this ministry never invite me back again because of your despondency over the resource that I am going to tell you that God has deposited in you. But if you do not embrace this resource, you'll never see the release of the power of God. Okay? So you know what the resource is? You know what it is? The resource is weakness. The resource is weakness. The resource is weakness. Say that with me, weakness. weakness. Say it again, weakness. The resource is weakness. And if, Daniel, if you pass this few leaders, if you stay on the train for a little bit, it'll be the bumpiest ride, but it'll be the best, best ride that you've ever had. Weakness, weakness. Wait a minute. You don't, you don't come to a conference and hear delivery around the subject of weakness. That, that's counter-conference to hear about weakness. Nobody, nobody talks about weakness yet. I want you to know that since 2007, millions of people have read books and taken inventories designed only to find out what their strengths are since 2007. They, they, what they do is they discover what their strengths are and then they use them for positioning for maximum effectiveness, effectiveness in their lives and in their ministries. But what I'm asking you today is to do something totally different. That is something against your very nature, something that is in stark contrast to everything that you might have gotten as a deposit from the TV you watch, from the conference you attend. And that's what I want you to do in my, in my hour. So you sort of in my, 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 my channel of auditorium, and that's this. I don't want you to spend time talking about how strong you are. What I want you to do is talk about what you're weak about. I don't want you to talk about it because the tendency in conferences is for us when we get together, particularly as pastors and leaders, is to always boast about the strength of our ministries. We want to talk about how strong our youth program is. We want to talk about how strong our leadership board is. We want to talk about how strong and mighty our material that we produce. We want to talk about the strength of our numbers. We want to talk about the strength of our vision. We want to talk, we talk strength, 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 strength. How strong, how mighty, how great, how good, how awesome, how powerful the thing is. And it draws all the attention to us, but no attention to the Father. So we get to talking about how great every time I get along with pastors and I get with pastors, I connect with them. They always want to know what's the strength of your program. We go to conferences for people to sell us kits to make our ministry stronger. 
And so I want to know how strong you are. What's the strength of your program? What's the strength of your numbers? What's the strength of your budget? What's the strength of your program? When you get back from the program, what they want to know is how successful was it? How powerful was the worship? They want to know strength, 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 strength. But what I want to implore you today is this. I want you to be comfortable with what you're not strong in. I want you to discover your weakness because if you discover your weakness, you discover God. If you discover the resource called weakness in this time that's given to me, you will release the power of God. Let me say it again. If you discover your resource called weakness, then you will release the power of God. So today, while I have the pulpit, I am your man of weakness. And our mission and your mission will be not to talk to anybody about the strength of your ministry. But your mission will be to talk about what you're struggling with. And don't talk about the struggle as though it's a scar. Talk about the struggle as though it's an opportunity for God to show up. It's no longer talking about my weaknesses as though it is a drudgery that has been laid upon me because of some curse in my life. It is my business to talk about my weakness because when I'm weak, I'm discovering that I have access to something that I had not access to before. And we all, we all have some kind of weaknesses. Whether it's immaturity like Joseph had or inadequacy like Moses felt or sexual temptation like Samson or David or Solomon or depression like Elijah had or being in the shadow of a mentor like Elisha or impulsiveness like Peter or oversensitivity like Timothy or criticism that Paul faced or some of us got professional weakness, others got ministerial weaknesses, others got personal weaknesses. But here's the thing, all of us got weakness. Every last one of us from this pulpit to the parking lot has some form of weakness in their life and we mask it with the strength so that we're not having to own and face our weakness. Some of us have a fear of controversy or anger or depression or guilt or rebellion or self-pity. We all have weaknesses. And Paul, listen to me, listen, listen to what Reverend Emmanuel says, listen to me. Paul teaches us how to leverage our weakness in order to access the power of God. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians, uh, in first, in, uh, in first, not 1 Corinthians, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, this is very interesting because, because, listen, it's very interesting because he begins to lay some incredible groundwork on why you and I, at least for my time, why we should celebrate our weaknesses. And he begins to lay the groundwork. And first, now, there's, there's two, two, two twin books in the book of Corinthians. I just want to br briefly hit it. That's because the teacher in me got to do it. There's a first Corinthians and there's a second Corinthians. The first Corinthians was written as some people would, would, would mistake to think that first Corinthians was written to celebrate Corinth. But really, it was written to bring order to Corinth because they allow confusion and division to invade the church. Paul had established a great foundation of faith and theology and gospel, and upon his departure and at a time that he had been away, something had crept in, and people, instead of operating, as Mom Debbie would tell us at dinner last night, instead of them operating in unity, they allowed the spirit of division to creep in among them. So when he writes this letter of 1 Corinthians to them, he's admonishing them and he's exhorting them to return to what you know. And what you know is we are most strong when we are unified than when we are divided. That our commonality is our strength, not our difference. And so he writes this letter in 1 Corinthians. He's telling them, I got word. There's a division. Some of you are kind of dividing along religious lines and le religious leaders' lines. Some, I'm a Cephas and I'm an Apollos. And some say, hey, I'm going to follow Paul. And he said, listen, at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus Christ. Some plant others water, but God alone gives the increase. 
And so he goes through and he's, he's systematically going through trying to undo and reverse all that they allowed to happen because division had creeped in. So he is essentially in 1 Corinthians defending the church and its ministry and its protocol and its proper procedures. He writes the second letter not to follow up on whether or not they kept track of proper procedures in the church. He writes this letter to 2 Corinthians because now they have moved from putting in order the things in the church to now questioning his legitimacy as an apostle. So now the second letter to the Corinthians is more personal because he finds himself in this letter having to do something that he did not have to do when he was with them. When he was with them and he introduced the gospel to them, they received it. They celebrated. They reveled in the gospel. And in fact, that gospel caused many of them to their hearts to change from sin and turn to God. Now in his absence, some false apostles, some false teachers, some false bishops, some false pastors have crept into the church. And what they've done is they have presented a brand of gospel and a presentation of that gospel that was contradictory to what they received when their father, the Apostle Paul, had lived among them. And essentially what they started doing was they started accepting what these false teachers and leaders were doing. Here's what they were doing. They came into Corinth and they started promoting their strengths. They talked about their ability to articulate the word. They talked about their ability to look sharp in the presence of the people. They presented all of the outward expectations and began to paint that as the strength. And we have been sold a bill of goods in today's church by thinking the cosmetic and the superficial is the evidence of God's anointing and his strength in our churches. We think that ultimately, because you dress it up, and you decorate it, and you are doing it with the bright colors that you've extracted out of the scriptures, that somehow that is a representation of the kiss of God. Amen. So essentially, we're selling people on the goods of looking good, smelling good, walking good, sounding good, but rotten to the core. And so they came in. And what they essentially said in Corinth is, do not examine me according to the context of my heart. Examine me on my ability to make you feel good. Examine me on my ability to cause you to stir emotionally when I sing a song in the highest key that you have never heard before. Examine me, as Reverend Appeal would say, by the number of entourage that I bring with me. Examine me by all the external, but do not evaluate or weigh the contents of my heart. Examine what I can make happen quickly. Examine what I can bring you right now. If you come over here, I'll have you singing your own solo. You come over here and I'll give you what that ministry would not give to you. Over there, they made you wait, but I will not make you wait. I will promote you instantaneously. Now, that wouldn't be so bad except the problem was, are you hearing me? The problem was, that the problem was, Deji, the problem was they were lifting up themselves and comparing them to Paul in order to discredit his ministry. They knew that the only way that they could undo his ministry was they had to undo his ministry by disqualifying his ministry. And the way you disqualify another man's ministry is you talk about it. The way you disqualify the work that somebody else is doing is you identify the negative that's in them by accentuating the positive that's in you. So they begin to position themselves and demonstrate we got something that your spiritual father does not have. We got the look that your spiritual father does not have. We got things that your daddy 
has not given to you yet. We've got eloquence that your daddy has not been able to communicate with you. You need to leave him because he can't hoop. 